welcome to E380. This is uh, uh, for uh, June the 7th, 2023. In any case, uh, the other day as I was planning what we were going to do today, it occurred to me that we'd been spending a lot of time on the uh, the current software issues of the day, generative AI and machine learning, and we really had been neglecting the thing that makes it really work, that is uh, the hard work. And um, not only that, uh, just about the same time that I was beginning to do this, uh, NVIDIA crossed a magical marker. It became the first trillion dollar company in the computer industry. And um, that was quite exciting. And it sort of suggested that the best thing to do was to uh, get uh, our um, uh, our class together and um, that, that's what has happened. Um, in any case, our, our speaker is from NVIDIA and uh, he can introduce himself. Jack, you're on. So hello everybody. Um, I guess I've already been introduced, Jack Triquette. Um, and I'm going to be talk. I've been asked to talk to you about NVIDIA's Hopper GPU um, and the design it did and, and how we went about designing it. Um, let's see. So today I'm going to cover just an overview of the Hopper 100 GPU. I'm going to talk a little about the hierarchy and asynchrony are key to its performance and how Hopper took advantage of these uh, components to accelerate them. I'm going to describe how the Hopper accelerates deep learning. Um, and then I'm going to finish up with a brief description of how the H100 GPU is used in systems to scale its performance. Uh, feel free to interrupt and ask questions as we're going along, and I'll see if I can answer them um, uh, uh, as best I can. Uh, so let's start with the overview. Um, Hopper is built on TSMC, custom four nanometer process, contains over 80 billion transistors, which makes it the world's most advanced monolithic chip, contains 132 SMs, each delivering twice the performance of our previous generation A100 SMs, and includes multiple new features, um, includes a new memory system featuring HBM3, a larger L2 cache, um, to deliver a much higher memory bandwidth than previous generation, and also supports multi-GPU superpod and cloud designs, a variety and added a variety of new system architecture features, including the fourth generation MVLink and new MVLink network, second generation multi-instance GPU technology, as well as new accelerated confidential computing support for secured accelerated computing. Um, so diving into the SM processor core itself, uh, you know, Hopper has made many improvements to the core. It features a twice a 2x clock for clock improvement on traditional FP32 and FP64 throughput. It supports a 256 kilobytes of unified L1 and shared memory storage, which is 33% more than our previous generation A100. It contains the new fourth generation tensor core that is 2x faster and significantly more efficient. Hopper also introduced a new dynamic instruction set for dynamic programming called DPX. Provides advanced opera infusion for inner loop and many dynamic programming algorithms. It adds tensor memory accelerator for efficient asynchronous data movements and multi dimensional tensor data. And finally, we added a new level of hierarchy between CUDA and thread uh, through the CUDA hierarchy of thread blocks and grids called the thread block clusters. And thread block clusters will enable us applications to take advantage of locality, additional locality that the GPU provides dramatically improve the efficiency of, of many algorithms. Um, Hopper has five HBM3 sites with a total memory capacity of 80 gigabytes. The memory system has been designed to maximize not just the peak bandwidth, but delivered bandwidth. To achieve this, it features improvements in both the memory, memory as well as GPU's memory controllers, which are optimized to run at dramatically increased DRM frequencies and redesigned to include twice as many memory channels per HBM site to maintain the same high efficiency despite the increase in frequency. As a result, we can achieve three terabytes per second of memory bandwidth, uh, 2x the throughput of our previous generation A100. 
Um, and a Hopper H100 made several improvements to our MIG technology. Um, uh, provides three times more compute capacity per MIG than A100 and roughly twice more memory bandwidth per MIG. Uh, we added dedicated image and video decoder engines to our GPU instance. Um, these are very important for our AI inferencing customers to do a lot of image and video processing. It's not just about the AI, but a lot about the image processing, and video processing you need to do in order to, to do the AI. Um, we combined our MIG technology with confidential computing technology for secure execution. Here, the trusted environment encapsulates one confidential VM running on the CPU with a MIG instance running on the GPU. Uh, we took advantage of the physical isolation of the units that the MIG already provide, the hardware MIG design already provide. Plus we added a hardware firewall to prevent any unauthorized access to memory from outside the trusted execution environment, including from other MIG instances on the same GPU. Uh, on PCI interface, we have SR, SRIOV, which stands for Single Root IO Virtualization. It virtualizes all the registers needed to control and program each GPU instance. All transfers on PCIe are encrypted. Each GPU has its own set of keys, so there's no data sharing between VMs or between GPU instances. And by combining the MIG and confidential computing, H100 has the world's first multi-tenant native confidential computing platform using a single GPU. And it's just kind of a, just a, a diagram, a table of where you can see the performance for, our main, for key mainstream HPC AI models, including many vision and neural networks or small language models. And you can see that we can develop anywhere from two to three times performance for our previous generation, where we both use InfiniBand to connect to the, the GPUs. Um, if you start looking at uh, adding MVLink to it, not using InfiniBand, but using the MVLink network interconnect, uh, it actually enables more efficient scaling across multiple GPUs, accelerating the nodes and providing a major boost in performance across HPC and AI, AI applications. Um, with this, with using MVLink instead of InfiniBand, uh, provide an additional two to three X performance improvement for HPC and AI training. Um, now I'm going to dive into the details of some of the new features for Hopper. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk over some key principles for performance and describe the improvements and features that Hopper has made to take advantage of those principles uh, to improve efficiency and performance. So there, here are two key principles for achieving high performance with parallel programs. One key principle is data locality. By moving and keeping the data, uh, program data as close as possible to execution units, a programmer can exploit the performance that comes from having lower latency and higher bandwidth access to local data. Another key principle is asynchronous execution. This means finding and allowing independent tasks and data movement to overlap as much as possible. The goal, keeping all the units fully utilized and avoiding serialization. So let's look at closer at data locality and cooperative execution. So locality can occur either spatially or temporally. With spatial locality, data and parallel execution have a spatial relationship, which can be thought of compute and data being co-located. One example of a computation using data, uh, data spatial, spatial data locality um, is spatial halo overlap, as shown in, in the figure. A, a common a com computation operates not only on the data that's in its rectilinear tile, it also shares data with the computations operating on adjacent tiles. Another example is where computation has a, a spatial sharing is one where one dimension has to be combined with data in a different dimension, which is not shown in the figure, but is also a common pattern. With temporal locality, data and parallel execution have a temporal relationship, which can be more thought of as compute passing over the data. Data stays in one location and compute kind of passes over it. In the example shown in the figure, First, one kernel processes the data in memory, and then another person, uh, kernel processes the data in memory. So let's review first the spatial locality that current NVIDIA GPUs before H100 supported. Um, in CUDA, locality can be expressed as a grid of execution, and a grid is mapped onto the GPU hardware hierarchy. Computation of the GPU takes advantage of storage local to that GPU. In the case of Hopper, that's 50 megabytes of L2 cache and 80 gigabytes of HBM3 memory. The next level of locality that can be expressed is a thread block 
which is mapped onto the SM hardware hierarchy. Here, computation can take advantage of 256 kilobytes of SM localized storage and the L1 data cache plus shared memory. The smallest level of locality you can express in, in CUDA is threads. These are mapped to hardware thread lanes. And here, the computation takes advantage of thread local register file storage, which is a one kilobyte per thread. Um, and this translates to 64 kilobytes per SM partition and 256 kilobytes for SM of thread uh, of register file storage. The way that work is mapped onto the hardware is making the grid level work and breaking into fragments of work and assigning them to the thread block. The figure shown is broken up as a two-dimensional grid, but CUDA hardware and the, the CUDA and the hardware supports three-dimensional mappings as well. So programmers use whatever the mapping works best for them. They don't, they, the hardware doesn't dictate what the mapping needs to be. Um, independent blocks each work on their own fragment of the problem. Within the blocks, there are multiple threads that cooperatively execute on the fragment of work they assign to that block. So this three levels of GPU hierarchy existed since CUDA was first introduced and has enabled parallel programs to take advantage of locality that exists in their algorithms and, and take advantage of the hardware locality that existed that was been mapped onto. Um, the challenge is that GPUs have scaled since then, since Judith was introduced by order of magnitude. Now here I'm showing the NVIDIA Kepler GPU, which introduced 10 years ago and had 15 SMs. Here's the NVIDIA Hopper GPU today. It has 132 SMs. We want an order of magnitude increase in, in 10 years. If you look at it, the entire Kepler GPU could fit in the corner of, of one Hopper GPU, right? Just a small corner of what the Hopper needs to be. The Kepler GPU is roughly the same size as a Hopper GPC level of hierarchy that we have in the hardware. To take advantage of this solution of locality, H100 adds an additional level of hierarchy to CUDA, the thread block cluster. Here, the computation take advantage of the GPC hardware hierarchy that has, and the 256 kilobytes of localized storage in the SM. SMs within a cluster can communicate directly with each other through an SM to SM network. In CUDA, a thread block cluster is just a big, is a block full of thread blocks. Uh, you can think of it as thread blocks on steroids. Thread blocks in a cluster no longer need to be mapped to be uh, executing independently. Like threads in a block, blocks in a cluster can cooperatively execute on their fragment of the problem. They can, they can exchange data, they can work, they can synchronize themselves. They don't have to operate independently. This enables us to target a localized subset of the grid, enabling more opportunities for programmability and for performance. In CUDA, a cluster is collected up to 16 blocks. Each block is guaranteed to be on separate SM and is guaranteed to be running at the same time. By running, by guarantee running at the same time, then they can guarantee to be cooperating and exchanging data and working together on whatever the problem sets up they need to be. They do not need to be running independently. Um, you can have a lot more threads and GPU execute resources, all cooperative working essentially on the same problem. In your CUDA code, you annotate the kernel with a cluster size and dimension. And just like blocks, clusters can, dimensions can be one, two, or three dimensional. Programmers use whatever bit fits their algorithm to what's being mapped. Or in the Hopper Harbor itself, architecture provides clusters with a direct SM to SM communication network. And using this network, one thread block can directly access the shared memory of another thread block. Accesses are done through a distributed shared memory model uh, laid out as a partition global address space. All memory operations are supported, including load, stores, atomic, synchronization operations. The communication network also accelerates synchronization and data exchange. Threads and thread blocks in a cluster can directly synchronize each other through barriers and distributed shared memory. It also supports asynchronous DMA operations between the thread blocks themselves. Now let's move away from spatial locality and talk about temporal locality. One form of temporal locality that is supported in existing NVIDIA GPUs is dependent grid launch executing on data in L2 and the HPM3 memory. In the figure, you see an example of a fast Fourier transform workflow. In this, the transport transform, there are multiple competition steps that are needed to form the transform, each with a different radix. 
Here, the data is moved into the HPM memory local to the GPU. From there, each step is performed by reading the data from the local memory, doing the computation, and writing the results back to the local memory, so it's available to the next step. The limitations of this is that each step must be a different kernel um, in the CUDA program model, and launched as the Radix algorithm for each step requires a different configuration of the SM. That means that the, between each step, any data stored in the SM must be first flushed back to HPM memory and then read back in uh, for the next step. To prove the efficiency of temporal locality, we added uh, a new capability, thread block reconfiguration. Going back to the FT example, you can see how this works. There's a single grid launch for the entire transform. At each radix step, the SM threads and register file resources can be reconfigured to match what's needed for the radix done at that step. At the beginning of transform, data is loaded from memory into shared memory and distributed shared memory for in, in, in things of in the concept of clusters. Um, and each radix steps perform without the data leaving that memory. So instead of you know, the temporal locality of execution passing over data in L2 and HBM memory, we now have execution passing over much closer and much more efficient SM shared memory. And let's look closer at another core principle performance that we looked at, asynchronous execution and data transfer. I'm going to first review how things work in a synchronous machine design approach. When working on parallel computation, multiple threads will work together to form that computation. Um, one way to do, do this is the way threads can work cooperatively. This is where each thread is doing some computation, but are working on different parts of the data. They're seeing the same computation, but working on different parts of the data. At each phase of computation, the threads will synchronize and ensure that the data they're working on is ready for the next step of the computation, next phase of computation on that data. Another model is where threads can have a more producer-consumer model. This is where data is produced by one thread, it's consumed by another thread, and they're doing essentially different computations and different parts of a pipeline computation. Here, the consumer needs to synchronize the producer to ensure the data has been produced and is ready to be consumed. In a synchronous machine approach, all threads must arrive and wait at the barrier until all other threads have also arrived at the barrier. They effectively are running in kind of a lockstep manner. This leads to inefficiency where threads and execution resources are idle, waiting for the barrier to clear. Now let's see how things work with an asynchronous machine design approach. Here, synchronization is split. There is an arrive, there's arrive at the barrier, and then there's a wait at that barrier. When threads are cooperatively executing, all threads continue to arrive and wait at the barrier. However, between the arrive and the wait, each thread can schedule thread independent work. So instead of being idle, waiting for other threads to arrive, each thread can be do busy doing useful work, and you can hide the, the, the cost of the synchronization. In the producer computer model, the threads operate in a decoupled manner. After the producer first produces the first batch of data, it arrives and immediately starts producing the second batch of data. It doesn't have to wait. For the consumer, if the data it needs is available, it immediately starts to consume the data without waiting or any unnecessary synchronization. As you can see, the, any, an asynchronous design approach can lead to much more efficient parallel execution. Before I dive into details of hopper improvement, I'm going to start with a view of the asynchronous barriers that were available in A100. So we already had the concept and, and the ability to do asynchronous barriers in, in A100, our previous generation. Um, consider again the example where a set of threads are cooperative executing on a set of data, as shown on the right. A100's asynchronous barriers split the synchronization into two steps. First, the thread signals arrive where they're done producing a portion of the shared data. And this arrives is non blocking, so the threads are free to execute other independent work. Eventually, the thread needs to the, the, the needs the data produced by all other threads. At this point, it does a wait, which blocks until every thread has actually signaled their arrive. And as shown before, the advantage of asynchronous barriers that allow the threads to arrive to execute on independent work instead of just waiting and spinning, waiting for those threads to happen. Um, new for H100 is the ability for the waiting threads to sleep while other threads arrive. On previous chips, the waiting threads have to spin to go through a spin loop on the barrier object and share memory taking up execution resourcing and adding latency. Now we've accelerated that sort of process where they can go to sleep um, and they don't take extra resources just uh, spinning on, on, on things. They just wait until the barrier resolved and they immediately start executing again. It's also new for Hopper is a new form of a barrier we call the asynchronous transaction barrier. 
The asynchronous transaction period is also split variable, but instead of just counting thread arrivals, it also counts memory transactions themselves. There are new commands for writing memory that passes both data to be written plus the barrier update. In effect, the barrier can be figured to track not only threads, but also, also asynchronous memory transactions as well. The transaction variable block threads at the wait command until all produced threads have arrived and all asynchronous memory transactions have completed. Now, this bear is a very powerful new primitive and it works great for asynchronous memory copies or data exchanges. So let's look how the new barrier support combined with thread, with block, thread block clusters improve the block-to-block -block data exchange. On the left, you see how block-to-block -block data exchange is done on, on older uh, NVIDIA GPUs. Data exchange through global memory using a barrier stored in global memory. If two thread blocks want, uh, wanted to communicate, uh, two SNs needed to communicate with each other, they had to go through global memory and synchronize through global memory. The sequence for the producer is they write the data, they do a memory barrier, or they write the barrier flag. The sequence to consumer is they pull the flag, determine the barrier is cleared, and then they read the data. To perform a data exchange requires three to four round trips through global memory, which is fairly very inefficient from a latency perspective. On the right, you see how things are done in Hopper. You see the producer stores data directly in the consumer's shared memory while updating the bearer that's also in the consumer's shared memory. This enables a minimum latency data exchange or one-way trip from the producer to the consumer and results in a 7x latency reduction. Hopper also accelerates memory copies using a new TMA unit. The TMA unit is able to asynchronously copy and do memory copies between global and shared memory, as well as between shared memory and shared memory between blocks in a cluster. Using the numeric transaction, it can do copies with minimal latency. The TMA is fully asynchronous with thread execution. There's no address generation or data movement or synchronization management overhead requirement on the thread. From the thread's perspective, it's simply it's, it's simply a fire and forget. It says, do this copy, and then forgets about it. Doesn't have to worry about it at all. This makes for a very simplified and efficient programming model. Here's an example of how the Halo data exchange is performed on Hopper with its new capabilities. Here we have a cluster of four thread blocks, each working on different parts of, of the data. When one thread block needs to get Halo data to another thread block, the other thread block writes it directly into its, own, into its local shared memory updating a local barrier, indicating the data is ready. So here the data exchange is efficiently done asynchronous, asynchronously and with minimal latency. Now to summarize, the goal of asynchronous execution is to keep all units busy on the GPU fully utilized, allow more overlap of computation and data movement. Hopper introduces an asynchronous transaction barrier for atomic data movement with synchronization and makes waiting on barriers more efficient. Hopper also introduces an on-chip accelerator for memory copies called the TMA unit. It frees the general purpose threads from doing memory operations and ash calculations, allowing the threads to instead to focus on independent processing of tasks and not have to worry about data movement themselves. You combine Hopper's improvements for locality with the asynchronous execution data movement, you can get dramatic performance improvements. Here you can see in, the, in this where you, the performance improvements of Hopper with these new capabilities you use, Taking advantage of locality and asynchrony, asynchrony provides two to three X performance benefits on these key algorithms. Now let's look at some of the improvements Hopper made to accelerate deep learning and AI. At the heart of the Hopper SM is a new fourth generation tensor core. It has double throughput per SM of all the data formats. The Hopper tensor core has also added a new APIF floating point format. It provides twice the throughput of FP16 and BFLOAT16 formats, as matching the throughput of 8-bit integer. In order to keep the tensor cores fed and keep the GPU power in check, Hopper tensor cores have also improved operand deliverancy by 30%. H100, like A100, supports sparse or tensor arithmetic, arithmetic, enabling 2x throughput when the data is also sparse. This chart shows the cumulative compute improvements going from A100 to H100. The increase in number of SNs provides a 22% increase. The fourth generation tensor core provides an additional 2x improvement. Switching from 16-bit floating point to the new 8-bit uh, floating point format provides another additional 2x improvement. 
And finally, the clock frequency improvements provide another 30% increase. All combined, Hop provides 6x, 6x throughput increase over our previous generation. Let's kind of dive into the new FP8 format support in a little more detail. On the left, we see the exponent range of Mantis Precision provided by each tensor core floating point format. You'll note that the tensor core supports two floating point eight, eight bit floating point formats. One provides an extra bit of exponent range that matches the exponent range of FP16. It can be thought of a truncated Mantissa version of FP16, much like how Bfloat 16 is a truncated Mantissa version of FP32. The other eight, FP8 format trades off one bit of range for an additional one bit of precision. On the right, you can see how the test score processes uh, FP8 uh, floating point, 8, 8 bit floating point data. The multiplication of 8 bit floating point data can be accumulated into the, either FP32 or FP16. Once the matrix multiply is done, various common network neural functions like adding bias and applying the activation function can be performed in the higher FP32 or FP16 precision. The final result is then converted to desired output format before being stored back to memory. The graph on the left shows a numerical distribution for a variety of network layers in a single language model. You can see that the distribution can vary significantly. Some have a wider exponent range that are best mapped to the E5M2 FP8 format. Others have a narrow exponent range require more precision to differentiate the value. These are best mapped to an E4M3 FP8 format. On the right, you can see that during the linear math computation, the range of the results can be outside the FP8 representable range. By performing the matrix multiply accumulation in the FP16 or FP32 formats, we are able to safely perform the computation without any loss. But when we convert back down to the FP8 format, we scale the results into the FP8 representable range. So the goal of this next position is to intelligently manage the precision and maintain accuracy while still gain the performance of smaller, faster numerical formats. Statistics of the output values of each layer of a network can be analyzed to determine which FP8 format is optimal and what scaling factors needed when converting to the final computation of, uh, into that F FP8 format. The figure on the right shows training of GPT-3 model and how the training error changes over time for various layers. It compares a training error using FP8 format using the, versus the native Bfloat 16 format. And you see that, you, know, you probably can't tell, but because the lines are right on top of each other. Um, the basically, the, 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 the using training using FP8 and scaling techniques, you can almost precisely match the error over time of the native Bfloat 16 format. On the left, you see a table of the final accuracy for a variety of networks using FP8 versus native 16-bit format. As you can see, the accuracy are nearly identical. Let's dive a bit more into the new TMA unit. I already talked about how the TMA unit efficiently performs asynchronous copies. It was designed specifically to handle complexity of copying and managing multi-dimensional deep learning tensors in memory. It will automatically compute the addresses, strides, bound checking needed for tensors up to rank five. It will even automatically pad out out of bounds values so you don't get junk when copies go out of bounds and you need to pad. All this is done with a fire and forget model from a single thread. Single thread fires it off, it does the copy, and, and the thread can continue executing. And once the copy is finished, the, 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 the asynchronous transaction barrier will actually get updated and then uh, computation can be done on that, on that copy data. So you can see, when taking all that in, how much end-to-end uh, -end speed up we get on a model like GPT-3 uh, with sequence like 2048. Um, and you can see that we get approximately almost a 3x application speed up using FP8 versus on H100 versus using Bfloat and A100. And all experiments were done running on a, a 64 GPUs. The Hopper GPU was designed with the rest of the system in mind. It was not just the GPU chip itself. It needed to be, make sure it can integrate to a larger system and run very well. So it has direct support for tight integration with other such components and ability to scale up and out. 
give you a brief overview of some of the integration and scaling capabilities of the Hopper GPU um, and how the systems are built. The Hopper GPU is, the H100 GPU is packaged in a module with 94 gigabytes of HPM3 memory with 3.5 terabytes per second of bandwidth. Eight of these GPUs are fully connected on a single board using the NVLink switches, providing 900 gigabytes per second of bandwidth per GPU. Here's what the board looks like when you add in all the heat sinks, IO interfaces, and other components. Now, here's a kind of block diagram of that board um, and showing the main components of the GGX node and how they're connected. There are two CPUs that help drive the system along with some uh, CX7, NIX, and PCI switches. All the H100 GPUs are fully connected with MV switches. These MV switches are also connected to high bandwidth MV link IO ports leading out of the node. And here's all packaged together in, in the node. This is what the box actually looks like. This node is plugged into a quantum two InfiniBand network with 400 gigabits per second of bandwidth per port. And this system can scale to hundreds or thousands of DGX nodes. Now, this system we designed actually provides for very efficient scaling. Here you see the end-to-end -end performance for weak scaling. It is almost linear going from 32 GPUs to three th over 3,000 GPUs. It also strong scales very well, not just weak scale, but strong scales very well. It provides almost linear speed up for Megatron going from 64 GPUs to 2,048 GPUs. And we expect to push that even beyond 2,048 as well. All right, now for questions. That's it, that's it in a nutshell. Um, you can find more information in the Hopper Architecture White Paper. Uh, any questions? Amazing piece of hardware, Jack. As, a, like, as, a, as, a, as the slide says, you know, this is many engineers worked on this and designed it and built these systems. So it's a product of a lot of work for a lot of people. Yeah. I can't, I can't take credit for it. <laughs> okay. And the, the, the one thing that, that of course is always a, a problem for this class of machine is uh, some of the advantage comes from judicious choices in layout of data and, uh, uh, structure of the program that uses the machine. And is that now entirely in the hands of CUDA or is it uh, something that a programmer needs to actually do the work to do the partitioning? Well, it, we, we provide multiple sort of um, um, abstractions, right? Now, there are people, if you want, you can program to the bare metal and handle everything yourself. Right. And CUDA has that level of abstraction. Um, and you can program in the CUDA level. When it comes to a lot of these networks, um, most of this is actually done under our libraries. And, and the abstraction that we would do is we provide QGNN and other libraries, uh, other sort of compilers and stuff that will actually map things efficiently. So people who are doing DL networks and trying to run on our systems, they're not programming in CUDA. They're programming in, in uh, you know, the more of the Python layer. Um, using regular sort of thing, and all our kind of all the software and abstraction and compiler and libraries and meet that do the the, the mapping for you. Mm -hmm. If I want one for my home computer, how's it going to cost me? Uh, which one? The, the just the DGX box, yeah. or you want the whole you know system okay. here, right? You want <laughs> you want this guy. Yeah, garage, I like the right? I like the big one, but the small one is easier to carry around. <laughs> no, I was just looking for scale of cost here. Um, I have to tell you the truth, you know, I'm not in sales and marketing, so I don't really know the exact cost for these things. Um, I I do know that that the uh, total cost of ownership and and the performance per total cost of ownership, as well as 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 um, execution. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 not just purchase, but to run it um, is actually very good compared to other systems. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually one thing that we do when we start talking about, I know, at least from how, how it filters down to me doing the architecture and stuff like that, is that, um, you know, 
you, you kind of think like, oh, it's all per, per, per millimeter, it's all this stuff. Well, you know, there are the, 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 the cost is not just in the chip. The cost is in the system. And you need to make sure that you build a chip that even if it's not the great perfect middle, like having all the MB-Link IO and all other support, um, says, well, yeah, that makes the, the chip less per, per millimeter, but it makes the system much more efficient and much more cost effective. Mm -hmm. so, so you need to kind of think about that. Also from power perspective and how you kind of manage things, because um, cost of ownership, power cost is a significant part of the cost of ownership. And you make sure that you do work well on that, even if it helps you know, hurt your per, per millimeter, you know, you got to think about the overall power of the system and how you actually make uh, the overall, the system more uh, uh, cost effective um, to the people who are buying it. Sounds good. I uh, questions, everybody. Okay, I have one person. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah I, have a, I, have a, I have a question. I'll just read the question which somebody put in chat. Okay. Uh, so 11 kilowatts TDP, I guess that's for, must be for a constellation of them, not for a single H100. Um, can you tell us a bit about power and cooling? Of the system? No, I'm not that familiar with it. You probably know more about it by looking it up than I do. <laughs> uh, I don't do the system design. I did GPU. And so, um, no, although I'm, I'm fairly familiar with some of the trade-offs and, and the concerns that they have, uh, uh, I'm not the right person to quote the right specs. You're, you, like I said, you probably looked up more information than, than what I know off the top well, of my head. Maybe could you just talk about from a GPU standpoint? Like, I'm certainly thermals are like a very big concern. Or, yeah, like what are aspects of the design which really were influenced by um, by power, et cetera? Well, so 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 the, the, the aspects of the design you look at, you know, the, the, you know the, the, these are the GPUs, and you know, when you add the heat sinks, all that. There's a lot of power to get out of there. Um, and part of the part of what you need is that that the, from the from the board, you know, the GPU, you'd like to have all the power in the world. And he says, well, I can get more performance by more power, but the, the challenge is that it has to fit into the form factor in the system. Um, and like I said, we're not we're one component of the system, and and like I said, I didn't do the thermals and and the the whole thing, but there's a lot of sort of feedback of 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 how we make sure that we're power efficient. In order to get the most power, most of most performance out of a particular power budget, and that actually influences uh, fairly substantially. Um, and uh, and I do know that you know there are different sort of systems, and you, again, you probably know better than I because you're asking these questions and probably looked into it a lot more than I have. But there 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 are sort of things about you know air cooled versus water cooled, um, and and what different data centers can support. Um, they're not all identical and you can't plug them all the same way. And so um, when you start looking at the, the performance power sort of curves, um, you know, the, you can actually get a fair amount of efficiency by going up the performance power curve, um, assuming the system can handle it. Um, so, so a lot of data centers are moving towards something where the individual nodes can actually take a little more power and getting a, uh, a lower uh, actual lower cost of ownership uh, by by riding that curve a bit better. Okay. So what do you think is going to happen next? Um, uh, now we're working on our next generation stuff, um, yeah. and uh, you'll see that you know eventually. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting challenges, um, particularly with large language models and 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 the direction that that AI is going to. Um, uh, as far as specifics, I don't think I can talk about specifics about what's. The, the the main problems we're tackling and how we're tackling them, um, but but this is not the pinnacle of where we can be. No, it's I'll just say, a, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it's a stepping stone in between. Yeah, and it's uh, it's an impressive piece of hardware. Yeah, but when you look at it, you know, sort of from a hundred thousand foot range, 
it's uh, basically just a, another collection of processors and memory put together in a clever way. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> it's years of effort to try to do that right. Okay. And quite amazing. Are there more questions? I, I don't yeah, see. I, I, I have a, this is, uh, sorry, I have another question. Sure. Is there anything could just talk a little bit about the memory interfaces and issues in memory like hbm3 um like the signaling rates bandwidth versus latency because there is like a bandwidth latency trade-off right hbm is higher latency over regular ddr can you maybe talk a little bit about like what the memory surface looks like from your perspective and what are when the, it, the it, challenges when it, comes to, when it comes to the workloads that we're dealing with um and, and how we architect our GPUs um, and, 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 and our systems and how they're programmed and how, how we deal with parallelism. Um, uh, we're not like a like a, a regular CPU where memory latency is king. Latency is not king. It, it's, um, it, it's, 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 it's a much lower concern. I mean, we don't waste it, but our main concern is efficient bandwidth. And efficiency from a you know just a utilization perspective that we make sure that we can fully utilize whatever bandwidth is given to us and also from a power perspective so one thing about hbm is it, it kind of does both of those it, it it has the you know the, the total sort of bandwidth that you want and has the more power efficiency than you can from regular ddr so so at least these types of system it's a win-win now you could say that it's also a lot more expensive so hey you know what it is but again, you have to look at the total cost of ownership, right? And then all the parts, not just what it is, is that if you can get a lot more performance uh, out of a more expensive memory subsystem, um, it can actually be a win for the other ones because it's making all your other stuff that you're doing to support the whole system uh, more efficient because your node is more efficient, more performant. So there's a kind of a funny little trade-off there I mean, thinking about oh I'm buying a you know a graphics card for my you know, gaming card for my my my, my uh, desktop, um, you know, HPM is too expensive and everything's the cost of there. But when it comes and, and and the cost of the card itself is pretty high. When it comes to the cost of of the of the system itself, um, um, it it is is not a big a factor and performance is a bigger factor. Power is a bigger factor. Yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess in the one sort of uh, maybe follow up that which touches on this uh, issue is, and so you showed some really impressive numbers for LLMs. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, you know, what kind of um, flop utilization do you see, right, um, on those LLMs? Like given the HPM bandwidth you have, so you got five banks, right? So that's a lot. Yeah. And so, but like, can those things feed the? Uh, can they feed the the GPU fast enough? Yes. Yes. Um, and you know, you know, I, I can't give you the actual specific numbers, but but you know, there are multiple layers and there are different levels of efficiency. You know, so it's not like all 100. percent Some things are running high. Some things are running, you know, more mid range and certain efficiency overall. The, the utilization is is is, is pretty good, um, and uh, I think from a, a system, I think you may be asking a system balance perspective. You know, the flops and 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 the HBM is the is the balance good? Um, it's a pretty good balance, and and part of part of the balance is that when we went from one generation to the next, we didn't just you know scale everything equally, right? We actually made this the this, this system. So that's more efficient. I mean, one obvious example of that is going from FP16 to FP8, right? That that having a smaller data format makes the memory system more efficient, um, and and you know you can get twice as much data in the same amount of bandwidth. Um, that's one obvious example. Uh, but you know just making sure that we schedule and manage our data and movement and 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 consumption in a way that can efficiently use and not waste, uh, or, 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 or when you don't need to use the HPM memory, you don't have to. Cool, thank you. This is a wonderful talk. Lots of fantastic de details. Thank you very yeah. much. Oh, you're welcome.
Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me well. So I wanted to ask about AI ecosystem support. So about uh, media's collaborations, partnership or initiatives to support the AI community, like developer programs, AI research grants, do you have anything that also would uh, benefit the future GPU developments? Because I see that it also gets me focused on AI programs. So I would like to know more about this. Uh, yeah, I'm probably not the right person to ask. I know we do have a lot of initiatives and, and you know, I, I see you know, in my email that we have sort of summaries of things are happening. I see new initiatives every day. Um, so I'm not on the, on the software side or the software stack side or the, the, the kind of the support side. So, um, you know, uh, I'm probably not the right person to ask that question. Um, but I do know that, that we do you know, have a pretty large sort of support and, and a lot of initiatives uh, to, to help people use and develop on our GPUs and our systems. Thank you. But, sorry, I can't help you with more detail. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, Jack, thank you so much. It was a, it was an outstanding talk. Exactly what I was hoping would you do. Um, so uh, I can't, I can't, I can't thank you enough, and uh, appreciate taking the time to tell us about the H one hundred and. Uh, now all I want to do is find out how to get one for my own use. <laughs> it's a, it's a gorgeous machine, actually. And uh, uh, well, I suspect difficult to use in a systems context because it has so many knobs to turn and so much local optimization that you can make an enormous amount of improvement by doing things very carefully. Well, you know, I think the access to, and again, I'm not familiar with the details, but, you know, a lot of these are being deployed in the cloud and, and you know, it, there should be sort of cloud access through, through various uh, uh, um, avenues. Um, so, you know, if you want to kind of use it as a kind of general uh, deep learning user or HPC user, um, probably people more interested about AI and deep learning. Um, that 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 sh they, they should you should be able to get accessible to that. As far as buying one of your own, um, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think you know that's. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't I don't know your your financial situation and and what you what kind of you know data center set up you have in your in your basement, but um, you know that's that's a bit more. Uh, a <laughs> little more, a little more. A, more my more guess is, my guess is that it takes a, it takes a, 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 a village to make enough money to pay for one of these things as an in individual standalone unit, and that's why we have cloud computing. But it now, is, uh, it's a gorgeous piece of gear. Now I will say that you know a lot of our, you know, things that you run um, and can run, and and and, and frameworks that you can run on on you know, these big large systems. Um, now they also can run on you know the, the the gaming GPUs that you that you buy at Fry. Well, Fry's is dead, but the Best Buy, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you no. Know, you know, so so if you want to experiment at a very small scale um, and play around at a very small scale, that is definitely you know available to you. And well, to anyone. Maybe people will be surplusing the C one hundreds then as a. Uh... Or an A100 rather is a, uh, a lower cost uh, uh, home computer. <laughs> I don't know, but this is this is a because of the the enormous factor of improvement. Just an amazing. Uh, that's an amazing gain, yeah. and it's almost all entirely architectural. It seems. Well, you get some gain from the. Well, I mean, it's always from the process. You know, there's more SMs and things like that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of architectural improvements uh, as well. And, and and I will say there's a lot of system level improvements that you can say as well. The MB Link, the Mellanox switches, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it, it's not just you know the sort of GPU from a system level perspective. It's a system level architecture that we really need to 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 in order to get these gains. It has to be a system level uh, design. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much again. And I guess with that, we'll close for the uh, for the quarter. All right. Thank you much. All right.
Sure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks.